the trend throughout the country, actually, both federal and state, is to provide greater protection for seniors or elders against elder financial abuse, whether it be the securities industry or banking industry, uh, real estate. So uh, it's does a hot, hot abuse, topic. Does it tend to ha- uh, be caused by, uh, by individuals or by uh, institutions, uh, companies, uh, government uh, organizations, uh, this kind of thing? What, what, who tends to perpetrate this sort of abuse? Um, individuals tend to perpetrate it. And unfortunately, the highest percentage of perpetration by, or by any group are by family members. And uh, that's, you know, and different family members in different situations. Uh, caregivers also uh, are particularly adept at abusing people uh, that they're taking care of. So that really between caregivers and family members, you've covered most of the bases. Uh, however, there are situations where I hate to say, but there were attorneys are uh, committing elder financial abuse. Uh, accountants uh, are doing so, financial planners. So uh, certainly the professions aren't immune from this wrongdoing. Uh, sometimes I, I have to think that possibly the individuals being abused may have created this uh, inadvertently. I, I give you the example of my mother. Uh, I'm an only child. Uh, my mother, who passed away, uh, gee, 15 years ago it's been now, uh, but, but she uh, gradually began to sink into uh, dementia. She had, uh, back at, at a time when she was of sound mind, and she was uh, of exceedingly sound mind there for, for many, many decades, she did not want me as her only heir. My father had uh, long since passed away, and again, as an only child. She did not want me to have to go through any kind of probate hassle or anything of that nature. She trust me, trusted me explicitly, went to her attorney and, and asked about this, and he said, well, if you really trust Jim, and, and the attorney knew me, and, and it, as it turned out, I would have to say, yes, I was quite trustworthy. But uh, uh, he said, if you really trust Jim, and I, I think you, you can, what you can do is put everything that's in your name in both of your names, that is to say your house, your car, your bank account, your CDs, uh, the whole ball of wax, everything into both of our names so that upon your death, all of them simply devolve into Jim's ownership, uh, which I must say worked magnificently. And uh, I've been forever grateful to her for that. But I've always been aware of, uh, of the fact that it was a darn good thing she could trust me, that I could have really ripped her off viciously. And I, I wonder your thoughts about what my mother did and what others may do in a similar circumstance. Well, uh, credit to you and your mom and, and her advisor. Uh, this situation that you've talked about works, far, uh, works well usually when there is only one child because you would receive everything uh, anyway. And she obviously uh, she has enough history with you to know that you're not going to uh, the Indian Gaming Casino every weekend with whatever <laughs> whatever you're and, earning. And, 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 and all of her money was used for her care in her later years, along with a good chunk of my own. But yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. But you know where, and you you know where the problem would be, and that is if you had siblings. And let's say that your mother said, "Well, I I want Jim to have all this, but Jim has agreed that he will then split it up with the siblings." Uh, later on. And and that does happen. Uh, sometimes people actually split it up, and more often maybe than not, they don't. Uh, and even if they are going to split it up, that kind of arrangement creates some tax and legal issues that are better um, addressed by way, say, of trust. Yeah, and there are a few things that can tear a family apart any more than, than divvying up uh, family finances. I'm wondering, uh, other than just the the uh, contrariness of, of people. You mentioned legal issues here. Uh, let's say that, that I had had siblings and that we more or less got along most of the time. Uh, what uh, legal issues might my mother have left us if she had had uh, more than one child and had, uh, had uh, provided in her will uh, the type of thing you just outlined? What, what are the legal issues she might have left behind? So there are a couple of different legal issues, and uh, most of the states have... Uh, probate courts or uh, something akin to probate courts. And for assets that are not in trust, the most of the state and that reach a certain amount of money, uh, generally those assets have to pass through probate. 
uh, which means that attorneys have to be hired for the estate. The estate needs a representative itself. And the, those uh, probate courts uh, and the process just adds on a lot of time and money and uh, that are kind of unnecessary. Uh, trusts are very helpful because normally trust assets can pass simply by an affidavit, death of uh, trustee or the original settler. Uh, but uh, that said, that doesn't cover all of the problems because there can always be arguments over whether the trust is valid or whether the trustee is taking good care of the assets or splitting the assets as was uh, designed and mandated by uh, the maker of the trust. Well, let me ask you about another phrase that uh, certainly comes into question, and that is the phrase of sound mind. Uh, I had actually, uh, I, I lived uh, on the East Coast. My mother lived in Missouri. She had been a, a widow uh, for gee, I guess about 30 years, and uh, uh, I had, you know, I would visit her. She seemed okay, getting older, maybe a little more frail. I had not realized until uh, one particular incident uh, one time that, that I apparently had granted her a little bit too much ind independence. We finally reached the point where it became clear that she was sinking into dementia, and I got ladies to, to uh live with her. She was really big on, on staying in her house, and we were fortunate to keep her in her house until she no longer realized that she was uh, was in her house. But uh, uh, we wound up, uh, in which I eventually got power of attorney and legal guardianship, and uh, there was a, a regular court hearing, I mean, in which there was a judge and uh, an attorney representing uh, my mother and an attorney representing me, and I was sworn in and uh, and uh, deposed and, and, and the like. And uh, it was uh, a very formal affair. And I must say I came out of it with a uh, pretty good respect for the way the law handled that. And it was uh, determined in that hearing that my mother was not of sound mind and that therefore there was in fact a basis that her affairs be handled by someone else and that uh, I as her only child and uh, reliable, trustworthy, and whatever else came out of that hearing was the, the person to be granted those powers. In other words, there was a process. I was impressed with the process. Your thoughts about how the law deals with that phrase of sound mind? Well, you've identified a process that, in fact, did work, um, and that's good, uh, of sound mind, which basically means capacity uh, and uh, or uh, ability to understand what uh, one is doing with a, an estate plan. So as a practical matter in wills, the uh, sound mind is you know who your you know who your relatives are, you know what your assets are, and you know how you want to divide them. Uh, it's a little higher standard when it comes to trust. But the easier way to do things is if you don't have to go through guardianships or conservatorships. And there are states that um, where <laughs> that where they're really controversial, primarily because of abuses. But uh, sometimes the fact that if you you can give, if you say your mother given had given you a durable power of attorney, which maybe she did, uh, that so that you would have um, control if you needed, uh, over her assets and had also created a trust and made you uh, the trustee of her trust if she became incapacitated or of unsound mind. At that point, you probably could have controlled all of the assets without the intervention of the guardianship court because you'd, you'd be the trustee for her trust and you could handle uh, any matters outside the trust. And of course, you'd want, and her, her, she should give you as well medical power uh, of attorney, essentially. Yeah. one eight six six five zero jimbo is our number, one eight six six five zero five four six two six. as we talk with attorney and author Mike Hackard, and uh, his website, incidentally, is uh, hackardlaw.com, H-A-C-K-A-R-D law.com. He has written The Wolf at the Door from Hackard Global Media, uh, subtitled Undue Influence and Elder Financial Abuse. When we come back, we're going to examine the four elements of undue influence. The baby boomers are getting older. More and more people are reaching that time of life, supposedly the golden years. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't, and sometimes for reasons such as elder financial abuse. We'll come back and take another look at the wolf at the door in just a moment. Welcome back to the Jim Bohannon Show as we talk with attorney Michael Hacker, the author of The Wolf at the Door, Undue Influence, 
and elder financial abuse. You document four elements of undue influence. One, the vulnerability of the victim. Are we talking mental vulnerability or financial vulnerability? What do you mean? Yeah, uh, we could be talking both. Uh, but you start with uh, mental vulnerability, uh, and you can call it inca- incapacity or um, so that there, and sometimes there, where actually will be a finding the person didn't have capacity or doesn't have capacity, but you don't for undue influence, which is excessive persuasion, causing another to act or refrain from uh, acting by overcoming their free will and resulting in inequity. Anyway, uh, for that you don't need to show incapacity because illness or a disability, some type of injury, age itself, or cognitive impairment, uh, even emotional distress, oftentimes associated with grief and isolation or, or complete dependency on someone or partial dependency on someone, that those all, all of those elements constitute uh, vulnerability. So, uh, yeah, you can find a lot of vul- vulnerability, and I think we litigate more uh, undue influence cases than most people do because I'm pretty invested in in this uh, belief that elders are truly getting taken advantage of. one 866 jimbo is our number, one 866 You also note the influencer's source of power and opportunities for abuse. Are we talking here about uh, uh, things that the uh, uh, influencer does above the law or or places where flat out the law just simply says, here, (laughs) come on in. I mean, that's not what the law intended to do, but places where uh, at least uh, the opening to this undue influence was provided by the law. Oh, yeah, certainly could be. Uh, And it might might well be that the the opening was, um, it was simply a family member, someone who uh, began to take care uh, of the elder, or it could be a non-family member uh, who's a caregiver. You can have people that uh, utilize their own sources of power. Uh, I mean, it. it I, I, we've got cases where it's a neighbor. A neighbor befriends uh, the elder and starts to uh, provide, you know, groceries to the elder or whatever. But ultimately, gains that elder's trust and then takes advantage of it as time goes on. One eight six six five O Jimbo. One eight six six five O five four six two six. The third element of undue influence, emotional, psychological, and legal manipulation as undue influence actions and tactics. I guess uh, uh, browbeating might be another way to put it. Yeah, browbeating, um, again, because I deal with this all the time, there's such a variety. But oftentimes what you'll see is isolation. In fact, I'm dealing with some cases this week that have to do with isolation. Um, and there are various ways to isolate the senior. One is that people will put a baby monitor, say, in the senior's room. So when any other family members or visitors come in, the isolator or the undue influencer can listen in and find out uh, everything that's being said. The other thing is I've seen it so many times, the senior's phone is taken away from him or her. Um, or a phone is... Uh, set up so that it won't accept certain numbers, like other family members' numbers. Uh, someone was just talking to me about a case uh, over the weekend, and they uh, I won't say too much except the fact that this particular person was trying to get in to see uh, his relative who was very ill, and somebody att- uh, you know came to the door and said, so-and-so doesn't want to see you. Well, so-and-so is dying, and uh, it's it's this person who is is- isolating that very ill senior uh, who's creating this problem. So those are the kind of things that go on. And uh, the fourth element of this undue influence, unfair and unnatural transactions or outcomes. What does that mean? Well, I can give you some examples. Um, some of it is in the setting of, say, um, step-parents. So um, if if someone is 70 years old and for most of his life he's had an estate plan that um, provides that his uh, estate is to be split up equally between his children, but in the last year of his life he marries someone from 
the Ukraine. <laughs> And uh, that person, within the last few months of his life, convinces him that really everything should be left to her. So that, that would be an unequal or unnatural uh, outcome. Yeah. There, there is a, a tool out there that uh, is, is very well-intentioned, uh, and, and that is uh, the reverse mortgage that uh, a lot of people, uh, as they get older, uh, become uh, equity-rich but uh, cash-poor. And, and you just can't uh, take uh, uh, a hunk of aluminum siding off your house, uh, saw it off with a chainsaw, and go down to the store to get a loaf of bread. A reverse mortgage, in essence, allows you to do uh, something uh, that, that is uh, not literally that, but, but figuratively that. Uh, are there ways that reverse mortgages can be abused? Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, because reverse mortgages uh, can either be used like an equity line so that people can take out so much per month, or they can take out one large sum. So I've done a fair amount of reverse mortgage litigation for seniors. The, where it gets abused is, um, say, a uh, caretaker or someone unduly influences a senior to take all of the money out, and then that person takes the senior's money. So the senior's kind of left high and dry, has a reverse mortgage on the house, but money is gone. Sometimes that's discovered during their lifetime. Most of the time it isn't. It's usually discovered after they passed away. So that certainly uh, is a way that you see abuse in reverse mortgages. One eight six six five zero Jimbo is our number. One eight six six five zero five four six two six. As we talk with attorney Michael Hackard, the book "The Wolf at the Door: Undue Influence and Elder Financial Abuse." It's very possible that some of the things we say tonight may uh, trigger uh, recognition in your mind. I've seen that happen, or maybe I've seen that happen to me. One eight six six five zero Jimbo. We'd love to hear your thoughts as we continue in just a moment. 